Right. 
Good morning, brothers and sisters, family and friends. Isang mapagpalang umaga sa inyong lahat. Welcome to the online worship service of ICLC Philippines. Sa ating panimula, samahan niyo akong basahin ang Psalm 46 verse 1 to 11. Psalm 46 verse 1 to 11. Ang Diyos ang ating kanlungan at kalakasan. Siya'y laging nakahandang sumaklolo sa oras ng kagipitan. Kaya huwag tayong matatakot kahit lumindulman. At gumuho ang mga bundok at bumagsak sa kargatan. Humampas man at umugong ang mga alon na naglalakihan. At mayanig ang kabundukan. May ilog na nagbibigay ng kagalakan sa bayan ng Diyos. Sa banal na tahanan ng kataas-taasang Diyos. Ang Diyos ay nakatira sa lungsod na ito, kaya hindi ito magigiba. Ito'y kanyang ipagtatanggol sa kinaumagahan. Nagkakagulo ang mga bansa, bumabagsak ang mga kaharian. Sa sigaw ng Diyos, ang mga tao sa mundo ay parang matutunaw sa takot. Kasama natin ang Panginoon ng hukbo ng kalangitan. Ang Diyos ni Jacob ang ating kanlungan. Halika, tingnan mo ang mga kahangahangang bagay na ginagawa ng Panginoon sa mundo. Kanyang pinatitigil ang mga digmaan sa lahat ng sulok ng mundo. Binabali niya ang mga sibat, pinuputol ang mga pana, at sinusunog ang mga kalasag. Sinasabi niya, tumigil kayo at kilalanin ninyo na ako ang Diyos. Ako'y pararangalan sa mga bansa. Ako'y papupurihan sa buong mundo. Kasama natin ang Panginoong makapangyarihan. Ang Diyos ni Jacob ang ating kanlungan. Ang sumulat ng Psalm 46 ay ang kanikora ng mga musicians at composers. Sila ay nakakasulat ng mga kanta base sa kanilang nararamdaman o sitwasyon sa kanilang pinagdadaanan. Iba-iba ang nababanggit na sakuna at trahedya sa kanta. Kagaya din ng iba't ibang pagsubok sa buhay natin ngayon. Pero, tulad ng psalmist, ay pwede tayong umasa at manalig sa Diyos. Ang pwede natin maging puso ngayong umaga sa ating pagsamba sa Kanya, ay ang puso ng psalmist sa verse 1 and 2. Ang Diyos ang ating kanlungan at kalakasan. Siya'y laging nakahandang sumaklolo sa, ar- sa oras ng kagipitan. Kaya huwag tayong matatakot kahit lumindulman at gumuho ang mga bundok at bumagsak sa kargatan. To inspire us in our giving, Jerry Tunnell of ICOC Aklan will give us the benevolence message. Then Papa Gordon Ferguson will share the communion message. Let us pray. Banal na Diyos na makapangyarihan sa lahat, kami po ay nagpapasalamat at nagpupuri sa inyo. Kayo lang ang dapat sambahin at wala ng iba pa. Sa panahon ng pandemic na ito, hindi kayo tumitigil sa pagpaparamdam ng inyong pagmamahal. Damang-dama namin ang inyong pag-aalaga saan mang kami magpunta. Dalangin namin ang kagalingan ng mga may sakit ngayon. Sa araw na ito ng aming pagsamba, naway maging bukas ang aming puso't isipan at pakikinig ng inyong mensahe. Dalangin namin ito sa pangalan ni Jesus. Amen. Again, welcome to the online worship service of ICOC Philippines. Good morning. I'm Jerry Tonel from Hope Worldwide Philippines and from ICOC Calibo. For our giving and benevolence, let me start by asking you this question. Kung buhay si Jesus during this time of pandemic, ano kaya ang ginagawa niya? To answer that question, let's open our Bible in Deuteronomy 15, 11. 
Deuteronomy 15, 11. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your brothers and toward the poor and needy in your land. What I like about this scripture is that it's simple, practical, and straightforward. This command was given to the Israelites before they entered the promised land. And Moses challenged them na maging bukas palad sa mga kapatid nilang nangangailangan. The same command still applies to us today as Christians na maging bukas palad sa mga kapatid nating nangangailangan. I believe kung buhay si Jesus ngayon, He would jump into action to meet people's needs. I'm grateful that in our fellowship, we have more than 600 families na natulungan ng simbahan natin. Yung essence ng scripture na binasa natin is a good reminder in times like this. Just like Jesus, let's be ready to help. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our brothers and sisters and friends who went the extra mile to give to families outside the church dito sa Aklan. As of May 12, we have helped more than 600 families by providing them food packs and water filters. Mga kapatid, for the past two months, as you noticed, madami mga tao ang nangangailangan. Pero mas nangingibabaw pa rin ang dami ng mga tao handang tumulong sa iba't ibang paraan. I hope and I pray bilang simbahan, bilang disciple, ready to help pa rin tayo sa ngayong klaseng gawain. Let us pray for our giving and benevolence. God, salamat dahil timely kang mag-remind sa amin bilang simbahan at bilang alagad mo na maging bukas at maging sensitive kami sa mga nangangailangan. Kahit may pinagdadaanan kaming krisis, no need is too great kung nagdadama yan ang bawat isa. As we give today, may we be reminded ng puso mo para sa mga nangangailangan. Naway maging pleasing ang aming pagbibigay. Maraming salamat. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, it's great to be back in the Philippines. Oh, I'm not there, am I? Well, that's sad. I really wish that I were there. I haven't been since uh, September, a year and a half ago. I came for one session of APLA and a graduation from APLA, and it was a great time. Teresa and I miss you so much. We miss being with you. Uh, we're grateful, though, for every time we were with you. And so it makes my heart happier just to know at least you're uh, enjoying this time with me and hopefully I'll be able to say some things that will be helpful. I'm coming to you at a very unusual time in history, right? I'm 77 years old and I've never seen anything like this. I feel like I'm in a parallel universe. It's a very surreal feeling. One day I get up, I feel one way. One day I get up, I feel another way. It's uh, just an odd, odd time. And it's a very stressful time, right? I think all of us have some days, have some times, when we feel like we're right on the edge about to fall over. We feel like we've reached our extremity. What do we do? And so as I think about life, at a time that is challenging. I try to think about a, a Bible passage or especially I think a Bible character that gives us some insights into how to view and to face challenges that seem overwhelming. And for a lot of us, maybe we're feeling overwhelmed with this or with something else. Life still goes on even in a pandemic. And so we've all got many things with which to deal right now, and it can be overwhelming. In the Old Testament, there was a king. He got in a situation, and he saw no answers at all. 
And so he made this statement to God. He said, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And from that verse that we'll read more in depth in a moment, from that verse, I entitled the lesson, when we have no answers, God does. And so back in Jehoshaphat's days, he was the uh, fourth king of the southern kingdom of Judah after the kingdom divided into the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, he didn't do everything right. He made some alliances with the northern kings that God didn't want him to make and God did not bless. But in the passage that we'll look at, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, I'm telling you this man had his finest hour and left behind some lessons for us that I think are tremendously helpful lessons in a time like we're living. And so turn over to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and we're going to look at some passages and some concepts together. The first point that I get out of this uh, chapter is, life can be overwhelming. And that's pretty much what was going on with Jehoshaphat and the southern kingdom. Verses one and two, it says, after this, the Moabites and Ammonites with some of the Minuites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Hezeron Tamar, that is, in Gedi. And so, put yourself in his place. You've got the armies of three nations gathered outside your environs to kill you. Wow, that's pretty overwhelming, wouldn't you think? And so he was saying, God, we don't know what to do. Well, obviously they didn't know what to do. They were outnumbered incredibly. And so what should they do? What could they do? Maybe you feel somewhat like that right now. We have a virus called COVID-19, coronavirus, that uh, is unique. I've read a fair amount about it, probably too much, honestly, <clears throat> but I've read a fair amount about it, and it is a virus like we've never had before. It is contagious, far more than most other viruses. We're not even sure of all the ways that you can catch it. It doesn't just attack in one way. It attacks in a number of different ways. It's very unpredictable. It can attack various parts of of the body directly. And of course, it's killed thousands and thousands of people infected uh, uh, way, way more than that. And so this virus is so unpredictable. That's the scary part about it, right? As one uh, infectious disease expert said in an article I read uh, just recently, he said, you know, what do you do about a virus like this? He said, you can take two 30-year-olds that are otherwise healthy. They get the virus. One is absolutely asymptomatic. He has no symptoms, but he still got it, and he can communicate it to other people. Then you got another 30-year-old that is in the hospital with a ventilator fighting for his or her life. So it is a very unpredictable virus. You know, you wonder, at least I do, where is God in all of this? I don't think we can know for sure. I did write quite uh, uh, an in-depth article. It's on my website, gordonferguson.org, and it talks about where is God in this. And it's an in-depth article, as I've said. Uh, if you read English, it would be worth your while to read it because there are a lot of lessons in it, I think, that we need. But there are times within such a pandemic when we think we're, we're cooked. We've reached our extremity. We don't know what to do. That's where Jehoshaphat was with his entire nation. What did he do about it? That's the real question. Uh, we can face times like this, but what do we do about it? I think we need to look at him and find out how he faced it. It's not an issue of what happens to you. It's an issue of how you view what happens to you. 
And Jehoshaphat gives us lessons for sure. The second main point I get in this passage is we must seek the answers from God. Picking up in verse 3, I'm going to read quite a long passage because it shows us some reactions from the king that are lessons for us today. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, uh, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in distress and you will hear us and save us. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt, so they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us for an inheritance? Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do but our eyes are on you. All the men of Judah, with their wives and children and little ones, stood there before the Lord. Now note the steps they took in going to God. They went to God. That's where they went. There are a lot of answers we could seek in many other places, but honestly, God has the answers. He's the one that we need to be seeking. They showed their desperation in seeking him by fasting. There are times when we're not hungry. Of course, if you get the virus, you may not be able to taste it anyway or smell it. That's maybe a good thing if you overeat. But at any rate, they fasted from food. They just wanted to seek God. They were so earnest in their seeking of him. And then it says that they all came to seek God together. The women, the children, the little ones, the men, they all came to seek God together. Now, right now, we're in the midst, many of us, in the midst of a, a time when we're told to shelter in place or to stay at home or to be quarantined or to have what I call house arrest. That's what it feels like sometimes. And so we're in a time of isolation. We're told to be in isolation. We're told it's the safest thing. We need to flatten the curve. Uh, but there's a type of isolation spiritually and emotionally that will kill us. It will allow Satan to do us in spiritually. And so right now we need each other. We need to be on the phone a lot. We need to be talking with people. We need to Zoom or Boom or whatever the term is. And I've been doing a lot of Zooming lately uh, to be able to contact with other people and to be able to see other people's faces. I need to be able to hear what they're feeling. I need to be able to tell them what I'm feeling. I need to get advice about how to handle some of the challenge that I'm feeling. And so uh, they came to seek God together and we need to be together in every way that we can connect we need to be connecting the king led the people in prayer and he had a certain progression in it uh, first of all he reminded god of history okay here's what has happened here's what you've done in the past they reminded god of uh, the promises that he had made that if they come together in the place that bore his name and called to him in time of uh, despair that he will answer and so they had the history to rely on. They had the promises of God to rely on. And yet then they laid it all out and said, we don't know what to do. 
it's overwhelming to us. So in spite of the history in which God had blessed them, in spite of the promises that God had get, given them, they are still fighting for faith. And that's pretty much the way it is in a time of high stress and high risk. We still are fighting for prayer, uh, or fighting by prayer for faith. Third major point, God always has the answers. In verses 14 through 17, which I'll not read, it describes God's spirit coming upon two prophets who then gave the king the answers from God that he was looking for. And basically, the answers were, don't fear, I'm here, don't fear. Do what you can, and I will take care of the rest. That was what God promised them. The directions specifically were to go out to the place of battle and assemble. Now God says you won't have to fight. But of course, they did have to fight. They had to fight for faith because when they went out and saw the vast army, in spite of the fact that God said, I'll take care of it in a way that you don't know yet, just trust. They were still fighting. They were fighting for faith to believe the promises of God. And that's pretty much what the spiritual life is about, right? The promises are many and they are amazing. But the way we're built, the humanness that we have, we have to keep fighting for faith. That is our challenge, to believe in the many promises that God has given us. And no matter what the odds seem to be against us, we've got to trust in the battle. So I look at life right now in the pandemic, and uh, I'm fighting for faith. I'm fighting to find answers. Teresa and I are praying. We are uh, talking with each other. We are getting advice from other people. We don't know why, what to do as far as contact with people in a close-up and personal way. We've got family that live close to us, but they're out and about more than we are. And so we're thinking, okay, what is the wise thing to do here? We're in an age bracket that puts us at high risk. My wife has a lung disease, COPD, a pulmonary disease. She's had pneumonia six, seven times. She's been in the hospital with it. She's been to the hospital any number of times uh, to get treated. And so with our health risks, what should we be doing? Those are questions we're all asking, right? We're trying to figure out what should we do that would be wise but at the top of our list every day is, what can we do to carry out the purpose for which God has us on this earth? We still have a purpose. We have a purpose of encouraging and helping all of the disciples we can possibly help. Uh, that's why I'm talking to you. It gives me an opportunity to try in some way to encourage and help your faith. Then we've got non-Christian friends and relatives that we're still reaching out to and figuring out how to reach out to better. And so all of us are looking, hopefully, for what is our purpose. I'm not going to obsess about the possibility of getting the disease. I'm going to be careful. I'm going to get advice. I'm going to try to do what is wise, but I'm not going to obsess about it. If I get it, maybe it kills me. Maybe it doesn't. Uh, I'm not going to obsess about that. I'm going to die sometime anyway, probably reasonably soon at age 77. So I'm not going to sit around worrying about it. I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and I'll let him worry about the rest. That's the challenge. That's what I'm doing. I am comfortable with that. I'm not actually worried about dying. Our good friend, Jerry Jones, who made some trips to the Philippines and tried to serve in the best way that he and his wife, Karen, could. He died a week ago. Uh, he went home. God bless him. Right now, he's enjoying heaven. I'm not going to obsess about something that's just going to get me to heaven maybe a little sooner. Now, I understand responsibilities. I understand others and, and family and all of that. But I'm just saying, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and we'll leave the rest up to him. Don't be stupid. Don't do stupid things. 
but on the other extreme, do not obsess. Finally, my fourth major point in this lesson is, faith really is the victory that overcomes the world. Notice how it all played out. Beginning in verse 18, yeah, early in the morning, they worship God. The next morning, they worship God and went out and did what God said. They assembled in the place that God said for them to assemble, the place of battle. They were determined to trust his promises to deliver them. They had slept on it. You know, sometimes the next day after we've made some pledge or some vow to God, we've come to some conviction. We get up the next day and we think, gee, did I really say that? Did I really feel that way yesterday? I don't feel that way this morning. That's why you make pledges. Doesn't matter how you feel when you get out of bed. Get up and go do what you know God wants you to do. And that's exactly what they did. They did not allow another day to dim their faith and their pledge that they made to God. It's interesting to me when they were assembling and they were praying, that they were giving thanks. It reminds me of a passage, one of my favorites in Philippians chapter four. He says in verse uh, six, and nothing be anxious. Well, that's a tall order right there. And nothing be anxious, but in everything, by prayer and petition, let your request be made known to God. Now that's what he said, but he inserted two words in the middle of that. He said, you need to have prayer and petition, but then he says, with thanksgiving. I used to wonder, why did he stick that in there? We're talking about somebody anxious. We're talking about surrendering. We're talking about trying to cast all your burdens on God. Why does he put with thanksgiving in the midst of that? I think he's reminding us as we look back in our lives at the blessings we've received. He's reminding us. He's gotten us through a lot of tough situations. He's gotten us through a lot of times when we felt like we were on the edge, that we'd reached our extremity, that we could go no more, that we were done. He wants to remind us, I've gotten you through plenty of things in the past, more than you can remember and if I've gotten you through all of these, why are you doubting so much? Cast your anxieties on me. And in that way, you can get over your anxieties. He goes on then, and you find the strange answer that God brought their way. If there's anything you can expect from God, it is to expect the unexpected. And so picking up in verse 22, it says, as they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. And you ask, goodness, they all came together, all three nations. They were a confederacy. They were uh, uh, an allied force. And yet, for whatever reason known to God, Two of the nations rose up against the third one, against their armies, and killed them. And then it says, as after they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. What in the world was going on there? I have no idea. I just know God did it. He, he brought that about some way. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert, and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. They destroyed each other. That's a huge lesson. That God has his ways. And in order to always make us walk by faith, the ways will most often be ways that you do not expect. God seems to major in that to make sure that we rely on him fully by faith. Bottom line, when we've reached our extremity, that's God's opportunity, as the old saying goes. Uh, we have to appeal to him. We have to learn to say, okay, Lord, whatever. Now, whatever is not so good a word if you're a teenager and you're saying in a flippant way to your parents, eh, whatever, that's not cool. Don't do that. 
that drives parents up the wall, teenagers. That's why you do it, right? Don't do that. But with God saying whatever, trusting him to do whatever he wants, that is called surrender. Notice then the result of trusting God to that extent in the rest of the passage. It says, So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off the plunder, and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value, more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect it. On the fourth day, they assembled at the valley of Berica, where they praised the Lord. That is why it's called the valley of Berica to this day. Then, led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem, for the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. They entered Jerusalem and went to the temple of the Lord with harps and lyres and trumpets. First thing they did when they got back was thank God. They were not like the nine lepers after Jesus healed ten and only one came back to praise him and give him thanks. They weren't like the other nine. When these people came back to Jerusalem, they gathered at the temple of God and they worshiped God with all kinds of musical instruments and great joy. The fear of the Lord came all the, on all the surrounding kingdoms when they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. He talks about a peace here, and there was a great deal of peace, no doubt. Philippians, back in the passage we talked about earlier, it says that uh, when we cast our burdens on him, when we offer prayers and petitions with thanksgiving, he said that you receive a peace that passes understanding. It guards your minds and your hearts in Christ Jesus. Your emotions and your intellect guarded by a peace from God that surpasses understanding. It is better felt than told. It is difficult to describe. It is a peace that only comes from God. And that's what this group had. That's what Jehoshaphat had and what I think was his finest hour as a king or just as a person who had an allegiance to God. He had a faith that got him and a nation through a time that was overwhelming. And whatever we're feeling today, how much overwhelmness we're feeling, how much fear we're feeling, how much uh, uh, faithlessness we may be feeling, God says, I, I can fix that. I can help you face whatever you have to face. There may be challenges. There may be tremendous challenges. But whatever you have to face, I can get you through it. I'll probably do it in a way that's unexpected. But I am with you. Trust my promises. Do what you can and leave the rest to me. I'm impressed with Jehoshaphat. I'm impressed with anyone in the Old Testament that relied on God and trusted him in the face of death because they didn't have one thing that we have today, and that is a picture of God in the flesh. We see Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, as the Hebrew writer put it. We see what he did. We see the death that he died. We see the blood that he shed for our sins so that we are without blemish, and without accusation, if we are in Christ. We have those promises, and we see the cross. We see the resurrection, and we know that we are guaranteed the resurrection as well. And so we have a confidence today that should be far above what the people of Jehoshaphat's day had because we have a crucified and risen Savior. And so at this time, we're going to end the lesson by going to that Savior in the Lord's Supper, in communion, a communion with each other and a communion with him. As we think about what he did on the cross, as we think about our sins being forgiven, as we think about the life that we're living for him, and as we look forward to the resurrection that we will have with him. Let's pray together take the Lord's Supper. 
Father, we are grateful for all the examples in the Old Testament that call us higher. We are moved by the example of Jehoshaphat. We are moved by the people that found a way to fight for faith and find faith and see the unthinkable done by your power. And Lord, we would have no idea how the sins of the world could possibly be atoned for when the blood of bulls and goats couldn't take them away. All of those sacrifices could not. And yet the blood of Jesus could take all the sins away that we've ever committed, all the sins that we will commit. We are a sinful people and we confess that, God, but we want to be righteous. That is the intent of our heart. So today as we take the bread that represents the body of Jesus that was given on the cross, as we take the fruit of the vine that represents his blood, help us to go back to that time, help us to see it through to the resurrection morning, Help us to look forward to the time that we are with you forever and ever. By the grace that was shown us, thank you for becoming a man in the person of Jesus. Thank you for dying for all of our sins. Thank you for giving us the hope of forgiveness, the hope of salvation, the hope of resurrection. Bless us as we take this communion now. In the name of our sweet Savior, Jesus the Christ. takes it though he tries what's true still the fall somehow gets it his life contradicts his belief in his mind and longs for relief trying hard to find oh some kind some form of joy from this grief then someone spoke to him this God who became man Oh, how it really seemed Such a crazy, crazy plan To save this fallen man My love compared to none The greatest sacrifice That to him we made Thank you, Jerry and Papa Gordon for sharing to us God's message this morning. To our friends and family, thank you for joining us. We'll be happy to have you join us again next week. Before we end, we would like to invite everyone to check out and visit our online platforms, icoc.ph website, ICOC Philippines Facebook page and YouTube channel, if you want to know more about our church worldwide, please visit disciplestoday.org and Kidogo YouTube channel. Please like, subscribe, and share.
so mighty, giant was so mighty, over nine feet tall, over nine feet tall, they could look so tiny, they could look so tiny, seem so very small, seem so very small, but your hand was with it, but your hand was with it, and the song he sung, and the song he sung, you give him the vision, you give him the vision, and for you he won. Even greater things are 